ten minute break or so, and after that you're going to be having a lecture from um, um, Penny Allen from the BBC, who's a research scientist in their user experience group, um, and you'll uh, get a well, you'll be having a lecture in a minute. Um, by her, or what it's like to do user experience in reality. Before we get started as well, on, in week seven, we're going to go on a field trip to Manchester City Art Gallery. Okay? So I've arranged for you to have, well, because there's about four, because there's about four, three groups on now, three groups of 20, um, three separate tours around the art gallery with some special uh, user experience kind of uh, teaching there, as well as a bit of a lecture I'm going to put to you in the gallery. But each of these experiences is going to be 45 minutes long. Okay? So that means we're going to go over our two hour slot. Now tell me, who has lectures at 1 o'clock? Nobody. Who would stay after 1 o'clock for about a quarter of an hour or so if they were getting a tour? Would enough people stay if they're going to do that? So I'm okay to arrange it and you're going to not be all like, oh dear, we're going over two hours. Kind of thing. Yeah? Okay. So, also, um, Toby Howard, uh, Director of Undergraduate Studies, will be uh, coming along as well. So he wants to, uh, so he wants to have a bit of a, a tour in some of the activities that you're going to be doing about thinking more emotionally and aesthetically. Okay? And uh, these tours are going to be given to you not by the gallery staff, but by some artists. Okay? Um, it's going to be through their modern art collection, mainly with some interactive stuff. Yeah? Okay. Next. If any of you got one of those cool phones where you can look at QR codes, this will give you a direct connection to the, to the website uh, and this week's aspect of the part of the website. So um, this website is now shut down, but you should be able to find it. Somebody's found it because they've, they've looked at the slides a hundred times, so somebody must have found the website. Okay. So the website should be up and running now. It's open course where it's a new thing the school's doing, so we've got to open course there aspect of the website. Okay? So if you want to if you want to look at this, if you want to uh, take a note of the QR code, you can. The website URL is OCW oh, OCW.cs.manchester.ac.uk forward slash new X. Also redirect from the syllabus pages. Okay. All right. So getting a bit more interactive. This, these questions we talked about last week, we discussed last week. So let's go through the order for this part of our discussion. Now, hopefully you've actually done something here. What is the significance of Tom's Diner in your everyday life? Anybody got any ideas about that at all? Please. I should start picking on people if I don't get hands. Any ideas? Yes? I was a track used to uh, uh, develop the pre compression algorithm. Right, okay. And he used it for his uh, sonic audibility. And basically, because the human ear. Is uh, most sensitive between two and five thousand hertz. Um, an athletic track is also perfect for fine tuning because they can get that right and replicate that same, and the rest of the uh, bandwidth is going to be replicated. Excellent. Excellent. Well done. Brilliant. Did all of you get that? Did all of you understand why it's significant in your everyday life? So it's, in, it's significant in your everyday life because without this, without this track being the test track, you'd be listening to crap music on MP3. It wouldn't. It sound like it sounds, okay? Because the algorithm that uh, makes it sound like it does can replicate this with the warmth, this track with the warmth of the human voice that it didn't do before, okay? That's why it's significant to your experience because without it, your experience of listening to audio on an electronic, on an electronic computer or a device would be much less, okay? Why is Tom's scientific of the user experience? Well, of course, that's a similar thing. The user experience um, is all about understanding what users need to actually have a good listening, to have a good experience, and by proving it with this track, that's what you're getting, a better experience than, than you would otherwise. Okay, so, again, what properties of Tom's Diner make it so significant? Now, you've already answered this question. Let's see if you can, you can pick that out from the answer. Any ideas? 
In fact, it's just been set, what's your name? Lewis. Lewis. So Lewis has just told us. Lewis has just told us why, what properties make it significant. So somebody tell me what properties make it significant. The range that it covers. The range that it covers. Okay, so the megahertz coverage is the range that it covers, and because it's an acapella of a human voice, that's what makes it significant. If it was just a standard musical instrument, it wouldn't be significant anymore because it could do that MP3 coming anyway. Now, the next part that I really want you to, uh, really want to announce it for is this. It might be more difficult. What does the significance of that represent? Good science. Why does it represent good science? Any ideas? Yes? Uh, potentially because, um, so this person who took, who, who heard, well, first heard Tom Blender playing and thought, oh, this is a good track to test my MP3, he was clearly looking for uh, ways to find his algorithm to fail so that he could actually get that and target it and make it better to, basically, basically he was looking for a way to make it fail so he could make it better and better. Excellent. Absolutely right. So, that's exactly what we're doing in science. We're looking for things to fail. We're looking to test things to destruction such that they fail. And if they don't fail, we can know this is scientifically valid, or at least it's supported. Okay? In science, we can never prove anything. Well, in empirical science, we can never prove anything. Okay? Now, we can disprove lots of things because we only need one instance of failure to disprove something. But we can't test all possible instances of something to prove it to be correct. So we can only support our um, assertion, our hypothesis. Okay? So he was looking for a way to destroy his encoding. Okay? And he thought, this thing here will never work. So how can I make so let's try it? He wasn't thinking, he wasn't trying to get tracks that would support his hypothesis that MP3 is brilliant and it will all work and his algorithm is great. He was looking at ways to, to make it better to improve it by it failing. And actually, there's a quote from uh, which uh, is on the uh, bizarre, just Wikipedia, and he says that um, so the bit rates um, the bit rates for most tracks sounded right before he tested some of his work on it. Okay, before he tested this Tom Darn on it. So that everything else sounded great. But when he played this, um, the voice sounded absolutely horrible. It sounded unintelligible. Everything else was great, but not this acapella track. So by making, by testing it to failure so that it would be really difficult for his encoding to work, he didn't think, oh, this is great, you know, the encoding will work and I can sell it or whatever. He thought, this is going to fail. And it did fail. So that, in that failure, he made something better. And that's what we do in science. Failure makes us do things better. Yeah. Okay. Do you all get now? Yes. I was just, I was just wondering. So it always kind of makes sense and like uh, it fits to every bit of the discussion. But I was wondering, can we not focus on Tom Snyder from a different perspective in terms of how it's significant in our really life? As in, <clears throat> for example, from the different background research, it turns out that she wrote the song about two separate days, and she kind of picked significant points and them together. If you're not looking at the, the perspective of, you're looking, she's looking at events that are occurring, but that a person doesn't focus on events that they're not actually directly involved in? Yes, we could. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. And that's also something that you want to think about for your original thought stuff, part of the component of your, of your exam. So yeah, we, do, we can think of those um, aspects. The point is that at some point we have to, and you should, in, your, in the work that you're doing, in the, your greater work, you should focus on these aspects. But, but we've only got, unfortunately, we've only got a small time frame to, to actually consider everything, and so I'm trying to, be, to keep it sort of semi-technical, um, but that's definitely the thing that, thing that should definitely be thought about, yeah. Especially because these time frames, um, certainly with um, components of user experience, like anthropology and ethnography and social science and sociology, those aspects are actually quite important. And in some cases, okay, so in software engineering, I think you did this in software engineering, let's see if you did. So this bit where you've got different components of different people ex people's experience coming together, how does that affect, how does that relate to software engineering? 
How does that relate to any of your software engineering practice? Changes the requirements, but how might we model those requirements to a software engineer? If we were a user experience person, how might we model those requirements to a software engineer? So have you heard of personas? Anybody's heard of personas? Anybody's heard of scenarios? Yes, scenarios? A uh, task analysis. Okay. What did you do in software engineering? <laughs> Yes, but what we do is to convey the information, instead of to try and do the translation from our language to a software engineer's language, also that we can look at sort of um, lot general, more general cases. What we do is we take fragments of people's experience that, that seem to work out for us and smush them together into a persona or a scenario such that we can better describe the experiences of people and what their requirements are, and this is the same for task analysis because it's a compendium of stuff done on different days and different times, um, sort of to the software engineer. So actually you could say that grabbing these bits that Susan Vegas uh, was um, trying to get to with these different parts from different days, smushing them together, she's giving a persona, a sort of a scenario for a user experience, her experience of the diamond in this case, but the reality is that we could think about that um, in, in software engineering terms if we want to. Okay? And that conversion, that linking up of the software engineering aspects and the uh, more human aspects is something that you need to be thinking about for your original thought and in everyday life. Okay, let's move on. Oh, coursework. Oh, so, coursework. Who, so first of all, who didn't enjoy this coursework? Come on, some people must not like it, surely. One, two, three, four, five, good, good, that's good. Only by knowing where there's failure uh, can anything be made better. So if you didn't like it, and there's a real valid reason, the platform you didn't like it, um, then you need to email me so we can do something about it. Okay? Although, in some ways, it might not be for you to like. Okay? Who got something out of the actual reading part? Reading this, reading the, the research paper, and going through the data, who understood more? Who thought it? Who thought? Who had a good learning experience, if you like, by doing it? You might not have liked it, but you understood something. Okay, cool. And so, who really hated writing to writing out this in two hundred and fifty words? Yeah, everybody <laughs> hates writing. Everybody hates writing it in two hundred and fifty words because that's why that's why I said it. Okay, it takes a lot to write two hundred and fifty to write it in two hundred and fifty words. You really need to know it. But writing it in a thousand words easy because you can waffle. You know, it's 250 words, that's where it's at. Okay? Okay, so let's have a quick discussion about this. Tell me what of the people, of all of you actually, maybe the people who didn't like it most of the most, what do you think, I think user experience is? Who didn't like it? Um, it's undefined. It's undefined. <laughs> it's undefined. Okay, so if you had to, I mean, say you were going into a, I mean, it's defined in some way because, you know, we've got. Some, Groups which are called user experience groups, and we've got people who call themselves user experience specialists. specialists. What, do you, what is it to you? What do you think it is as, as you? You're a computer scientist, you're a trained computer scientist, two and a half years worth of computer science, plus all the stuff you've done before. You should have an opinion on this. Tell me, what is that opinion? Uh, no? Okay. At the back, you didn't like. You're not really that's Alex. He's a, he's a fourth year PhD student. He doesn't see he knows all this backwards and unconscious. He dreams about this every night. Who else didn't like it? You liked to like it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you didn't like it. So tell me, what do you think user experience is now? Um, it's the way someone feels about using a product or okay. a service. A product or a service. Okay. Pretty that's what it means to you. The simplest definition. Yeah? Okay, that's fine. This definition, that's okay. Anybody else who wants to venture what it means to them? Yes, yes. Easy to it's just a term, it's not the final word, it's people have got a whole new term, decide what they think it might mean for them, and then they're all trying to fight with each other to say that no, it, it, it means to me what it means to me. Right, um, yeah. Which is why, you know, why it's not hard for them to agree to Excellent, yeah, that's, that's one version. Yes, what do you mean to you? 
I guess what one way I look at it after like discussing with a few people is that actually user experience is also from like we experience we have user experience in everything we do because um, like I mentioned in the previous lecture, not everyone's brains are identical, so or not just the brain, but in general, like the way we think, our experiences over the past number of years have been different and therefore influence the way we think differently. So even though we might have a general kind of idea of something in a similar way, we will still each have a kind of a smidgen of a difference with the things that we you know we feel or you know the things we give importance to and things like that. Okay, and why is that why is that important for software engineering? Um, I guess that's important because it's it's I mean think about the number of people who use computers, right? Um, it's very hard to act, very accurately capture um, a system or an interface, let's say. Which will appeal to every single person, or like yeah. basically what you aim to do is you aim to find an interface which will appeal to the majority, whilst maybe hopefully adding maybe the special extras to make it easier for other people to adapt to it or things like that. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's good. And you have uh, a so what I did uh, before I read the paper I actually wrote down what I feel about user experience as a as a term is. Yeah. Uh, and what I wrote as is an experience that leads to the emotional or any, any kind of a feeling to to anything in daily general life or or with a particular system anytime. So yeah, and it's it's a very important and uh, so seeing user experience from the different side uh, to my placement where it, whatever the system is per, or good enough for everyone, it's how you how someone is perceived using that system is yes. totally different. Yes. We have to change the perception of the whole thing. Or other thing to come out as oh that thing's working. Yeah. Before that it was working. So that's a feeling or an emotional attachment that you have. That's something. Yes. It's very subjective as well. Yeah, that's very good. Very true. Mm -hmm. Yes. In terms of software engineering, because um, we have to think of the anticipated of the product, so we have to think have some imaginable like, use cases that uh, we have to think of how to uh, make a better user experience. Absolutely. And those use cases can be modeled as personas, scenarios, use cases, task analysis. Okay. And we also said, um, oh, I just say a second ago, see. I'm too old for this job. Um, anticipated. What all these things are trying to do is the scenarios, the personas, the task analysis, we're trying to anticipate users and their needs. But we might be wrong. In fact, we're often wrong. Okay. The problem is when we're software engineers, you might not all think it, but of com how many here are, you, uh, are computer scientists here, actually, by, I mean, I know we've got some people who are taking option, different options and that. Are you all doing computer science, software engineering, or something else? Who's doing computer science? Who's a computer scientist? Who would say, I am a computer scientist, hardcore, right, okay, so quite a few. <laughs> okay, so, all of you as computer scientists, you might not know it, or might not think it, but you think markedly different to the rest of the population. And um, the reason why you think why you do this is because you are not trained for computer science, but it is in some way fits into who you are. Okay, and we can see this by this phase we're coming, you know, on computational um, thinking. Okay, whereby computer scientists think differently and to everybody, to not, not print most other people. Um, and that difference in thought allows them to tackle problems that are more abstract, that are, abstract, that are more undefined. But it also means that you really aren't the best people to understand users because you're not really like them. Okay? No real users would actually choose a Linux shell over a They really wouldn't. Okay? But a lot of computer scientists do because they think that's better. Okay? So that's why you need to also be aware that what you might think is good for the user experience, you need to get outside opinion because it might not be. Now the same is true for mathematicians. You know, I'm not even going to get into mathematicians, but you know, anyway, so I'm a little bit strange to Okay, so, hopefully you've got the idea that user experience is something that's very, very new at the moment, okay? It's quite nascent, and we're not really sure how it's going to fit together, but we do know it's got other things than just the standard kind of stuff to do with um, mainstream human and computer interaction, which is all about really um, measurements, measurements of time to completion and task completion times. Okay, so let's get into a bit more of this lecture. So, how did UX emerge? Well, 
in general, you it, it emerged from the HCI field, as we know. Now, HCI is a cross-disciplinary domain anyway, as we spoke about last week, and it's got dis different fields which cover that thing together. Now, these fields, psychology, sociology, social science, computer science, these fields are all different from each other, really. And the thing about them is that in HCI, we often use the methods in these fields because they're human-facing methods. Well, those methods not, might not be right. They might need modification okay, for, for us to use them correctly in computer science itself. So what you'll find in, say, for instance, psychology or social, social, sociology, social science is that they're mostly about testing. So they say the human we're going to put some. We're going to make an intervention, and we're going to test that intervention in, say, psychology. And that, and in psychology, it's normally single people in a lab-based scenario. Okay. Now, sociology, social, social science is very much focused around surveys, questionnaires, very structured work. Okay. And those guys are interested in looking at large populations, giving them surveys, and then getting some kind of quantitative information back, some information with numbers in it back, whereas a sociologist and an anthropologist are not so worried about the numbers, they're worried about the qualitative work, what this actually means on more of an individual scale. Psychologists, and they, they'll do that in the wild, if you like, in situ, so they'll go out of the lab and do this. Now anthropology in the old days didn't used to go very far out of the lab or the research institution, it mainly used to be there, uh, they there was a, a type of anthropology called veranda ethnography or veranda anthropology, whereby you get some sort of, well, often rich, um, rich, I suppose let me characterise this, rich and bigoted uh, guy, uh, man from Western Europe, Northwest Europe, that they go to some place in Africa or wherever else it may be, sit on their veranda and say, come here and tell me everything. Okay? And that is really bankrupt. Um, there's two main schools of uh, anthropology, and those are in uh, ethnography, those are in Chicago and Manchester. Um, and in reality, what we do now, what people do now in anthropology, is they go and sit and be with the actual populations. Okay, so you, might, and they may be individual, indivisible from the groups that they're in. Okay, so that's very much in the field. Psychology is very much about asking people to come to your lab and testing them with stuff. So you might plug stuff in, plug them into stuff, or get them to um, understand better, well, get them to perform sets of tasks which are measurable. And then you come out with statistical outcomes. Okay? Computer science, what testing, do we do in, what testing do we do in computer science, mainly? You're all computer scientists, somebody must know, surely. God, I hope you do by two and a half years into a three, three year degree. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, testing, what? What testing do we do? Huh? Functional testing. So, mainly the stuff we do is uh, white box, white box testing. You should have this in software engineering, right? Yeah? Test driven development. Does the function execute without bugs? That's it. If it does, it's good. Fit for purpose, next. Yeah? That's pretty much what we do. Um, but we also do something different to the others because we create. So we create stuff, okay? We create the thing and then we test it. Now, how do we create it? Do we do anything beforehand? Don't know, okay? So UX is really practical HCI with benefits, if you want to call it that. And this with benefits means that it's got this additional aspect of emotion, of aesthetics, of games, of uh, fun, but things that are more emotional and intangible, which you wouldn't normally come across in psychology, sociology, you wouldn't normally come across it in um, computer science in general, okay, and in HCI in general. So it's got this fun, it's got this emotional component which is difficult to model, difficult to quantify, and so it's annoying. The reason why it's difficult to quantify, and that makes it annoying for business, for people who want there to be an answer. We all want there to be an answer. One plus one is two. We want an answer. But when it's like, well, it could be, might be, don't know. We're about 98% sure or 80% sure. What's good enough? So that's the problem. That's why some people don't like UX because it's got this intangible component and it seems to dilute um, the hard science of HCI. Okay? But I don't think that's the case really. It just means we know a bit more. Okay, so this is the main important part. So generally, you should, it's a big 
On page 43, you should put a big star. Why is user experience important? It's important because at the moment, for most computer science, users are silent. Okay? They don't get input mostly. You might, they might do a bit of requirements analysis, but I mean by the fact that I asked you software engineers, what kind of stuff have you done in this kind of domain in software engineering? There's not much. I know Robert's done some stuff with you about you know, user modeling and that kind of thing. Okay? But that is not very much for, it, for all three or the two and a half years you've been here, I don't think. So really, users, even in our education, are silent. And if this course didn't run, this is its first year, if this course didn't run, what would you know about users? By the time you finish the three-year degree, not much. Okay, so that's the pro that's that's why it's important because users use your systems all the time, and then um, mostly at this point they're silent; they don't you don't interact with them. Um, systems can form to the user, not vice versa. Jeff Raskin, who, in, who designed the well, what did Jeff Raskin design? Jeff Raskin, what did he build? Did they put a hand or you just went over? <laughs> Something. Anybody? So, oh, Googling it, I can see there's a hand Googling it. Come on, fast. Okay, so um, Jeff Raskin, he designed the Apple 1 and 2, and he designed the interfaces for it. We all think it's Steve Jobs and Wozniak. No, no, it's Jeff Raskin. Okay, he also worked on a system called the Canon Cat. Okay. Um, and he was a very great um, proponent of a thing called cognetics, okay? Not the hippie weird cognetics, but actual cognetics. Um, and here, what he's saying is that there's two ways of doing this. You can either create your system without any input to the user, without thinking about the user at all, um, or you can actually create it with some idea about the user. At some point, the user is going to have to conform to the system, but the amount of conformance that's required is all down to you. So therefore, if you design it with a user in mind, the user has to conform less and is therefore more efficient because it follows their process. Okay? That's what that's the whole point. And that's the whole point of his work for Apple. Okay? For doing the work that he did with Apple and the user and the interface. Okay. The other thing about user experience, which you should know, in fact, we'll get onto why you should know it, but maybe somebody can tell me. Systems are less concerned with generalizability. So these, these um, objective measures we've had from, say, usability and accessibility and these kind of things are all concerned, in, in an old school HCI, are all really concerned with generalizability. How, can, how general is this to the population? If I test 20 of you, will your experiences be the same as 100,000? So that therefore I can only test, test 10 of you, but I know that this is how 100,000 people can work. Okay? We know this works in some cases. Who's heard of Fitz Law? Fitz Law 1. Anybody want to mention what it's about? Fitz Law? No, so it's about the time it takes you to select a target when you're pointing, using the pointing device. And Fitz Law works for everything. Mice, mouse, the mouse is made for it. Okay? So Fitz Law is one example of this. But the thing about UX is it's less concerned about this generalizability to the population. How do I know? How, well, in our paper, that we've just read, what makes me think that? Even though I think it's anyway, what makes me think it? Any ideas? Could it be the data in table 2, page 46, which says at the top, fleeting and more stable aspects of the person's character? That kind of thing. Okay, so these fleeting aspects, these, these less stable aspects of a person's character, mean that you can't say that their experience is generalizable to the population very easily because it might not be even generalizable to them beyond the five minutes they're experiencing it. Okay, the systems are less concerned. The systems are less concerned with measurable tangibles and with more holistic approaches to this kind of work. I'm just going a bit faster now because I'm conscious that the time is running out. Um, so modern UX is exactly right. It's exactly like what you said before. What's your name, sorry? Yeah. Andy. So Andy said it's kind of untangible. We don't really know what it is. We don't really know what's going on, what's happening with it at the moment. And that's right. It's very still very weird. So 
We just think these things, what, this is what we think modern user experience is, or what I think modern user experience is. We'll get to my definition at the end, but it's more than just tangible factors. Okay, so it's not just about what you can measure, what you can see, what you can create a metric for. It's more than just functionality. So if you're going to do functionality testing, it's more than that. You need to do more than that to understand the people. Um, moments of engagement. So it means, so this moments of engagement and touch points are two different words that are used in different, um, different parts of the process. But touch points and moments of engagement means that we're not looking at long-term engagement. It might just be a moment of engagement that you get a good or bad result and then that goes away again, even for the same user. A touch point is something whereby they can always think of, something they can always think of. That this allows them to touch the system better than just, it's just um, a solid wall of text, say, that, say the design of the iPod. People, there's no reason why people wanted to get the iPod as opposed to some other kind of MP3 way, but they did, and they came for it. And because there's a touch point there, they touched with Apple, they touched with the design ethos, they touched with the um, aesthetic, okay? Well, the actual sound production is pretty similar. Okay, slightly different, but pretty similar. Um, it's really object the objectivity blended to subjectivity. Okay, so it doesn't look for both. And this means, well, it means... What's it mean for the people you're going to be working with? So what kind of people are you going to be working with if you're doing user experience? Any ideas? Any ideas what? Yes. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone, that's good. Yeah, pretty much everyone. But let's narrow that down into a work setting. So what do we think? Yes. It depends on the, which sector of the business you, you work in. Is it is a car industry or if it's just within the car industry, it's a man. Uh, if it's in, or maybe in flight entertainment system, there's totally different sectors in how you can capture, uh, segment the people in. We would work. That's true, but there's there's going to be some. So generally, you're in you're working with lots of disparate, different different kinds of people. But just think, some sort of training sectors, degrees, if you like, that these people will come from. Yes, now I'm going to get people's names wrong, but I want to call you in front of them. Right, tell me in what. You put your hand up there. Yeah, I was thinking like administration is a big area where I, it's basically people who aren't. Who are trying to do something and want to do it quickly, and they want the interface and the focus of the, the, the bit in between to be as least hassle as possible. So I'd say administration business sector. Cool, okay, good, yeah. Now let's step away from just the general people into the technical people. Technical degrees. Or, well, not technical degrees, degrees, yes. I do don't know your name, but you're from Australia. Yeah. yeah. What's your name? Uh, Malcolm. Malcolm, okay. You're going to be working with scientific people to please romantics. Yes. Scientific is romantic, so that's true. And some of these people, let me get let me get a bit further. I like that. Let me get a bit further. Some of the people you're going to be working working with are industrial designers. So people who aren't software engineers, they're industrial designers. They design products, okay? Or they design industrial artifacts. So the iPod itself isn't wasn't developed by some software engineers and computer scientists. You know, it was developed by industrial engineers, industrial designers, it was developed by product designers, okay? What other kind of people might you be working with? Graphic designers. So you want something to look nice, you want it to have the aesthetic, you're going to be working with graphic designers. So these are the kind of software engineers that also the people who are implementing. And hardware engineers, may, electronic engineers especially, may implement these devices. So you are going to be responsible for understanding the user experience and conveying what is required from the user and then testing what comes out of that at the end. And you're going to have to communicate with all those people. It's much harder than communicating with just one set of people like software engineers. Because you're going to have to do the translation between all of them and you. Okay, so you're going to have to try and understand what's what's going on. So yes? So, sorry, just sure. a question in terms of communicating all this to different types of people. Is this communicating, finding a way to provide <coughs> one definition, let's say, to to provide to all of them to capture the ideas, or kind of tailor each one to each individual based on the subject. You start off with the with the most coarse grain coarse grain authority to, to hopefully be able to, do, to to convey the information to them in a coarse grain way. But for instance, a persona or a scenario probably won't be much use to a graphic designer because that's not the way, the way they think. So they'll want a wireframe, maybe, or something that's 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 kind of drawn by you and then they take further. Okay. You shouldn't be doing the design. 
You shouldn't be doing the industrial, the industrial design or the product design, but what you should be doing is trying to facilitate communication and let them know what the user needs are. Okay. And then testing it. Um, you've also got to do the translation. So certainly for things like... So tell me, who understands what coding is? Coding. Who understands what coding is as software engineers? What? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Three people know how to code. Surely not. We all know what coding is, right? We all know how to code, surely. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, we all know how to code. So, that being the case, um, would we know what coding is if we were anthropologists or ethnographists? ethnographers? The answer is yes, we know what coding is. We just wouldn't know what your kind of coding is. But in, co but in anthropology and ethnography, there's a, there's a process of methodology called coding. Which means categorization of um, uh, interviews, etc. Okay? So, that, the categorization of those interviews is something that uh, we need to think about. So, if you're saying to the oh, I'm going to do some coding now, they'll think you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, interviews and start underlining the categories and categorizing those key points. Okay? So, that's a translation you all need to make too. Okay, so let's get on to this in a bit more detail. This, this uh, in, in, onto the paper. So the first thing is, who's with me in understanding why this is, might be a problem? Why will table one in your notes, why might that be a problem for our understanding of what people think user experience is, as related in the law paper? Yes. It's only 57% is, uh, of the 275 people is from the four countries. They can't generalise. Yes. Yes, so it's from it's different backgrounds, different country backgrounds, okay? But certain people have different ideas about what things are and what things mean and how things are important. So for instance, Finland. Why is Finland up there? Why do you think Finland's there? Nokia. Hmm? Nokia. So Nokia, yeah, Nokia. And also it might be, I don't know. In fact, let me have a quick look. I've not thought about this before. No? Okay. Why then America is a second? Lots of more UX, UX, user experience people in America. Also, this sort of stuff was done at various conferences, and Boston is one of them. I presume there will be another one in Finland. So, you know, where you put the conference also dictates who you're going to get. So this, this for a start, you need to start to be critical. But this, that all this in this paper might not be right, because it only takes a very small subset of different nations, different nationalities, different people, and different understandings. Yeah? Okay, so that's the first thing. Keep that in mind. Be critical. Second, oh, that's a horrible slide, isn't it? That's not good for the user experience. Uh, okay, so what do we think? What do we see? These top three statements, you can see that it's in your notes, page 46, table 2. So, this topic, fleeting and more stable aspects of a personal person occurs in and is dependent on the context of the artifact that's being experienced. Notice how they say artifact. They don't see software, they don't see interface, they say artifact. Okay. That's significant because it speaks more about the industrial and the product design of the thing than it necessarily does about the computational resources within it or the interface within it, even if it's not the <coughs> same interface. And the prior exposure to an artifact shapes subsequent user experience. Right, so this bit here, can you tell it, is, is something we know from usability anyway. It's learnability. Okay? So of course, prior, prior exposure shapes your um, experience. If there's, if there's a system you really hate using, you're going to dislike it, even if you don't have to use it very often. Okay? But you, you have no opinion when you first go to, to form that opinion of non like. If you then make changes to that system to make it more likeable, it's highly likely the users are still going to take, take some convincing because they come with a preconception of the fact it's published. Okay? Um, in fact, they have they have this with um, Google Word, Word, not Google Word, Microsoft Word's tool. It's not toolbar. I have no idea what they call it now, but it's, it's kind of beyond the toolbar. So it's anyway, yeah, tool stuff, tool fragment things that expanded a bit at the top. Ribbon. 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 Yeah. People, when that was introduced, hated it. And still, and now they've had to switch and give them two different options because most people don't like it. Okay. Yes? But doesn't that re uh, reflect the way everyone doesn't like change? Well, it's not changing now. They didn't like changes at the start. 
But the, in, the, in the next version, it's still there, but now there's the option to change it back. So how many people would change it back? That would be an interesting question. I don't know how many people would change it back. So it might be people don't like changes. But also, and they come with a preconception, but oftentimes they like changes for the better, if they can see there's a positive point. Especially if you tell them there's a positive point before they get to experience it. Okay. okay. It must be grounded, and we're going to do this. UX must be grounded in user-centered design. We're going to do user-centered design in two weeks. Okay? Um, I can spend two full courses talking to you about user-centered design, and we're going to do it in two hours. Okay? So that's why it's at 30,000 feet. Um, and UX is based on how a person's perspectives uh, perceives the characteristics of an art face, but not on, the or not on those characteristics per se. That's coming back to what you said. It's about the, the perception of whether it's going to be a good or bad experience, how it's going to be. It can, you can change their experience by giving them the perception of that experience before they experience it. Okay? So that's something you also need to think about. So we can see that getting down to the bottom here, People will never have comparable UX. Each and every interaction with the product results in a unique experience. Okay? So we can see here that the response rate is, is high, but it's down here. 2.57, 2.85, out of 5. 2.84, yeah? Okay, so it's, it's below halfway. People don't think that. It only seems like they do. Okay, so people think that actually there are some comparable experiences for half with UX. If people didn't have comparable experiences, there'd be no point in doing it. Because what we're doing is, because if everybody was that individual, then why would we bother even thinking about designing something for a set of people? There's got to be some similarity, some commonality. Okay? It's just not so generalizable as we want to imagine. Okay. So the thing, I, the thing on this uh, table, on page 47, is I want you to look at this. Key ideas about user experience. I might say to you in an exam, what are the three, what, give me three key ideas about user experience. I might say that. Okay? So put a little square on that. There's something I want to you to I want you to read these. So on page 48, quickly read these five definitions. We won't get to yet in the next slide, but there's an example of something that makes kind of a bad study. Not too bad, but there's one thing that just makes this study slightly bad. Just read them. Now, if anybody's read them, what do they think that might be? Whenever you've got an idea, let me know. are in your addendum, which is on your orange bit of paper. Okay. So all these graphs, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. Tell me why it may be, it might be, that D1 is the most preferred by industry. Tell me why it might be. Yes. Make reference to the company. Exactly right. D1 is the only question that makes reference to the company. So quite likely, it's likely that in some kind of biased way, uh, somebody's going to think, oh yeah, company. Mm -hmm. I'm a big company, I'm from the industry, it's company. I like this one best. <coughs> yeah? Because it mentions the company. So the terms of reference can often dictate how these things, how these surveys go. That's why surveys, I don't like them that much. Okay? I'll come out and say it now, I'm not a big fan of the survey. Okay? So, this is what we're saying, D1. Now, totally, this one, D2. D2 wins. Have a look at it. 
So let's have a look at what D2 says. A consequence of a user's internal state, the characteristics that design them, and the context within which the interaction occurs. Okay. So I think that's quite a good definition, actually. I think they're kind of right. It's not, not exactly my definition, but I think they're kind of right. What do we think about D2? Do we like it out of all of these? Who, who, put your hands up, then. Let's do a quick uh, survey. Who likes D1 the best? Two. Okay, I like D, that's good. Two. Who likes D2 the best? Ooh, one, two, three, four, five. Five, okay. Well, I can see that my attempt to bite you by saying it was my favourite didn't work, or it worked inversely. Nobody wants to like, do what the lecturer likes. Uh, D3. One, two, three. D4. Three. D5. Two. Do it a quick mental arithmetic. Quick, uh, arithmetic. Half of you didn't put your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Very bad indeed. Okay. So you can see that actually, from what I can see, D3, the entire set of, that, of effects that is elicited by the interaction between, <coughs> is the one that most people like. Fine, I think you've got for that. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's fair enough. We, we are slightly different from the, uh, from the herd, but only slightly different. And in fact, academia, as you are, it's second. So that's good. Okay? We've got a slightly different view. I presume that a lot of these people from their backgrounds are going to be also at the conferences, the places where they've got these responses are going to be not just straight computer scientists. Okay? They're going to be uh, property designers, interaction designers, those kind of people too. So that gives a big mix. Okay, I'm not going to bother about landscapes and time scale spans because I want to give you a break for coffee before we get on to the, um, the stuff with uh, the BBC. Okay, so, but I do want you to look at this. You'll see there's a difference between this and the standard XCI. It's in your notes, obviously, page 47. So my view, my view is that it collects people, methods, tools, and techniques together, okay, for, and combines them for a practical application. Why am I telling you my view? Why does it matter what my view is? She's all right, an exam. No, I'm very practical. I'm liking that one. Very practical. Right, but why else? Yes, hey, you're the one here next to us uh, talking about your experience. Uh, That's true. That's true. Hey, any more? Yes. It's the best that anyone can do. Right? Yeah, it's the best that anyone can do. But also, be critical. I'm telling you this so that you know that when I'm talking to you about this, this is my view. I'm far more likely to give you, be giving you my view than some kind of uh, sort of uh, unbiased opinion of what it feels like. I've written these notes, so if my view has dictated how I've written these notes, so I could be wrong. Theoretically, I'm not, but I could be. <laughs> okay. I don't think UX is practice, I think UX is practice and application. It's not primary research domain. Now, some people disagree with me, but I think it's a secondary field of study because there's often aspects of user experience that will emerge by doing it. Okay. Um, it's an umbrella term for a multitude of specialisms. It's observable. So I believe it is observable. We can see it. We can see it through biometrics. We can see it through brain scans. We can see it through lots of other aspects. The time of task being one. Okay. Go about this loop response. Eye tracking, that kind of thing. It describes a software artifact in a holistic way, not, and it's not a layer in a route to development. Some people see this as being a, one layer that you have to go through. Okay. One loop of the spiral design diagram, one little box in the waterfall, and it's not, it's everywhere, it's through all of them. Okay. So then we've got my little view, and I say, in the notes, 49, it may evolve, and it evolved. From the time I wrote it, to the time I gave this lecture, it evolved, because I don't like testing anymore. I think we're evaluating, not testing. Testing seems to be too rigid. Okay. So I think we're evaluating not just testing. There's a subtle difference which we'll get to when we talk about scientific method, <coughs> but you should know that, that this, this stuff evolves. Okay. It's amazing how much I can talk, isn't it? Um, pop quiz for next week. It's in your notes, age 51. I'll be asking the questions. What's the key focus on HCI? What's the purpose of the UX specialist? What is the user experience? How does it apply? If there are no 100% correct answers, Oh, 
How do we decide what's right and wrong? What are the five key properties of the user experience that are in your notes? Okay. Now, to do for next week, so there's no misunderstanding. UX Popsker's discussion, and we'll do read up your notes on building under the umbrella up to page 73. Okay? That's me again. If there's any, uh, you can come and see me Wednesdays, Fridays, um, or email me, phone me, whatever. You can contact stuff. Next, we've got 10 minutes. Be back here at 12. I don't want to show you these slides. Um, we've got, because we've got a lecture by Kenny Allen on the next lecture that we'll be interested in this Some of the terms that Kenny will be using, you might, you might not know yet. That's okay. Look them up if you're really bothered, or just wait for, wait for it to wash over you and connect them later. Okay? See you in 10 minutes. That means 12... Uh,